Let's welcome Mr. Mark Cameron back to the episode. How are you, good sir? Hey, Mark. Great. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not a newbie, so you kind of have an idea of what's going on here. So we'll get right to it. Um, so Bone Rattle is your third go around with Artless Cutter. Um, can you give our audience a brief overview of what's happening in his life this time around? Yeah, so in each Arliss Cutter book, I like to explore a little bit of a different part of the state of Alaska where he works, a little bit of a different part of the culture, different native cultures. And um, part of the, the differences in what the Marshal Service does on a daily basis. So in Bone Rattle, um, Arliss Cutter and his partner Lola Tariki are headed down to Juneau for a sequestered jury where we... They have to basically hold the jury um, in a hotel, you know, and, and monitor their calls and all of that. And so they're concerned about the problems with that during a, a big drug trial. And then, of course, um, down in Juneau is a is a completely you can't get there by road. You have to either take a. In fact, the the joke down in Juneau is you have to. There's only three ways to get there. You um, by plane or boat or birth canal so <laughs> it's a it's a land you know it's a locked place huh. you um oddly that's our state capital so anybody that's uh, <laughs> the least bit prone to conspiracy ideas or notions wonders what our politicians are doing out there so far away from the bulk of the population so this is a book about um an archaeological find and a, a, a native find that stops a pretty expensive mining operation and all while Arliss is down there on this kind of mundane job and uh, of course murder ensues and <laughs> Arliss and uh, Lola get to kind of catch the bad guys. All right, right. Well, uh, great, good segue to my next question. Um, bone rattle uh the title comes from an archaeological find early in the book and kind of kicks off what's happening so was that an invention a pure you know literary invention of yourself or from yourself or had there been recent finds or articles about things about native uh finds that uh, kind of brought that up to you yeah the, so the so the the fact that it's made out of bone and horn is an invention because oh. the the real the sure enough raven rattles that clinket uh indians clinket native alaskans um alaska natives made were made out of wood made out of cedar and hmm. that sort of thing and probably had a little bits of deer bone or deer uh hoof in them for rattles but that didn't last very long so but there was a raven rattle that was discovered in a fairly recent tomb, like back in the early 1900s. Um, and it sold, and because it was, again, fairly recent, it was protected from the elements and made out of a, a more rot resistant cedar, it sold for half a million dollars. And, cool. and I referenced that in the book. So the, um, and I reference not only that it sold, but also what uh, Alaska natives think about us selling their stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, no. How would we feel if somebody dug up our grandmother and sold her ring because it was buried. Right. So there's a bit of, uh, a, a bit of understanding that we probably need to, to wrap our heads around in Indiana Jones is one of my heroes, but he could very well be the bad guy. If you look at yeah, it, that's true, know, right? In the wrong line. Yeah, that's true. Well, of all the characters you write and you write a few, um, Arliss is obviously the closest parallel to you, at least professionally. Um, professionally. <laughs> now, now that you've lived with him for three books, have you learned any additional insights about the character? Or is he such a part of your own experience and psyche that you know exactly how he's going to respond and exactly what he's going to say in every scenario? Well, I wouldn't say I know exactly. I think it's always a surprise. The um, I know him, but you know, just like we, you, you know yourselves, and I know myself, but. Sometimes I'm surprised by how I react given a certain situation. And I think Arliss is that way, especially because he's, if I'm doing it right, then he's growing and he's, he's, um, he's learning new things just as he teaches Lola tracking and some 
um, woodsmanship and, you know, how to, how to be somebody that gets along in the woods and not just man tracking, but just being a naturalist. Um, she teaches him about life and, and being happier and, and um, kind of maybe it gives him a little bit of a shot in the arm for youth when he's <laughs> not, he's at, he, Arliss really acts older than he is mm -hmm. and yeah. a, bit, a bit of a, a grumpy 2.0 and so I, uh, I enjoy writing him. And, and in the next book, there's a, I'm actually finished with the fourth book. It's called Cold Snap. And it's cool. already into the publisher. And we signed for two more. So nice. there'll be a five and six. But um, in the beginning of Cold Snap, which I'm actually going to read a little bit tonight at an event, or this will be taped later, but tonight at a, um, an event at King's English Bookstore, a virtual event that I think they're out of Salt Lake City. But um, in the beginning of Cold Snap, we go back and we get to meet Grumpy and Arliss and his brother Ethan when they're quite small, like nine and 11. Oh, and so awesome. just for a few short pages, we get to see them. So that's been fun to look at Arliss. I, I know what he's like now, but now to go back and see what he was like as a young boy yeah. and then a young man and what made him how he is. I love I love his relationship with Lola. I love I love that yeah. interplay. I think it's a it's one of the one of the yeah. things that really makes the book feel like more than a thriller. Like you're you're reading about a friend almost. I mean that's just kind of the I know that sounds trite, but that's kind of how it comes across. Oh, I thank you. I appreciate that. That's where I want it to be. So I think a lot of people recognize that relationship in their own in, in some ways of their in their their own lives, and that that makes him that much more realistic as a character because they're maybe, maybe somebody's in reading your book and saying, Oh my God, this is exactly what I'm going through right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what we hope. That's what we hope. Right. Right. Um, Artists and Mim seem to be dancing around the fringe of uh, being more than just friends, lifelong friends. Um, do you have a specific plan in place for these two? Or are you just kind of letting the writing kind of take you in a natural progression uh, as they kind of circle each other in this uh, more than just a friendship zone here? No, that's <laughs> yes and no. I, don't, <laughs> I do have a plan. I know how it's going to end. I just don't know how they're going to get there. And um, I'm, I'm one of those readers or viewers that doesn't really, I don't like it when there's that, sexual tension and emotional tension between a couple and then they get married halfway through the run of the show or the book. I like the tension to be there. There has to be growth, but I think the, um, when they get together, I, it would surprise me. It may turn out this way, but it would surprise me if they get married and then there's another two books. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think there's, you know, there's probably going to be, it's, a, it's an Arliss Cutter book. So there can be pretty dark. So there's probably going to yeah. be some, some dark times between now and and whenever it does end who knows um mm. i i don't think i can carry any series on for as long as some folks do i'm not i don't have a, the brain that works that way because i do see the end mm. when i start writing the book oh wow so at some point i have to get there and whether that's six books or eight books or whatever um we'll see but uh Ooh. I love the characters and I, I'm yeah. learning more about he and Mim every, with every book. And you see, and she gets, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but she gets more page time with every book. Yeah, I, that's and, exactly it. Yeah. And, and with Cold Snap, she gets, with Bone Rattle, she gets a, a good deal more because she accompanies him down to Juno. Right. And um, in Cold Snap, she gets uh, quite a bit as well. Hmm. Oh, nice, nice. Your titles on these books are freaking perfect too. That's by the way, you should <laughs> title the new one Cold Snap. It's excellent. Well, Bone Rattle is uh it's a tremendous stew of colorful characters, competing agendas, uh, multiple villains, corporate greed, native lore, and of course the rugged Alaskan landscape that is always central to these books. And there's a lot in there, but it, it meshes together beautifully. And I'm not just saying that. I it I was starting to weigh all the different elements of this book when we were preparing for the interview. And I thought, man, there's really a lot here, but it doesn't, yeah. 
it doesn't feel like you're putting a bunch of stuff in there. It just flows really well into the story. But my question from an outsider's point of view, it's surprising to see so many of the same issues that affect the low, lower 48 occurring up there, especially at some place, as you said, is as unique as, or as a remote as some of those areas are. You've worked law enforcement in m more than one geographical area. I know you spent the latter part of your career in Alaska, but what aspects make Alaska unique from everywhere else from a crime perspective? Well, I think remoteness and weather. You, you, you can't necessarily expect, you know, we always, I've got friends that work remote areas in the lower 48 um, where backup is an hour away or two hours away or mm -hmm. a couple of, you know, several hours away. Mm -hmm. But in Alaska, sometimes it's days away. And I was chatting with my editor about this because weather plays such a big part in these books. Yeah. And um, he said, you've always, it seems like you've always got an, a, an impending storm or it's getting cold or it's, you know, and, and that's true. But that's, I mean, I look out the window and that's just the way it is. Yeah. You, uh, we had snow I, it didn't stick. I mean, we still have snow in our yard, but um, we had a good little dusting of snow two days ago here. So, and it, you know, it didn't keep planes out of the sky or anything like that. But in Alaska, you could have, and I've had this happen to me where we were out somewhere remote and a volcano goes off <laughs> and all air traffic is grounded for a couple of days because yeah. that ash is so um, not caustic, but it's, it'll, it'll, it's mm -hmm. gritty. So it'll tear up a, a jet engine. So um, you've got just the, just sort of the roughness of the area, you know, the geography, how distant it is, the weather, the, the land is just, you, you can't run across it. You can't, part of the area, much of Alaska would be like, I assume, Wisconsin, you know, land of a thousand lakes. It's just really, when you fly over, it's just glistening and, and, and wet. And so if, if I read a story about Alaska where somebody gets in a foot pursuit across Western Alaska, I know they weren't there um, if it's not freezing cold. Cause the only time you can run over that land is when it's frozen solid. Um, otherwise you, I I've stood on places with going out on canoe trips with my kids where the land is actually floating on, you know, like the <laughs> moss is floating on the water and um, you can jump up and down on it like a trampoline and the whole thing, like an acre or two of land will just oh, kind of undulate. Goodness. And someday in a book, in fact, I had it in a book that I never did finish, but someday in a book, somebody's going to fall through that. And I just think that would be an awful way to go to have the land just swallow you up. Oh, and you yeah. end up in this murky tannic acid water that oh, with four feet of sphagnum moss floating over the top of you that's so, drowning sucks as it is but you yeah had that exactly worse. <laughs> exactly the last the last couple of seconds of your life would be really crummy so wow uh, there's just stuff like that that you don't think about and, and every area has its thing I yeah. mean, rattlesnakes and stuff in texas but alaska's just got that extra little unknown that's pretty terrifying you mm. know. that reminds me of the old quicksand stuff we remember uh -huh. like the yeah. 70s shows there was like a, a death by quicksand like every week i can imagine oh, yeah. i saw quicksand. a tweet about that where somebody said you know i really thought quicksand was going to be a bigger yeah. problem in my life <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but but then you come up here we we had quicksand on my our farm when i was a little boy and you would sink a grand total of like eight inches. It was just really cool, but you didn't go anywhere. It was just a stream <laughs> running under sand that looked dry. Wow. But um, you didn't, it wasn't like, like um, the Princess Bride or anything where you <laughs> went down into the, had to, right. had to escape. But up here, the mudflats act much the same way. And you can walk out on the mudflats on Turnigan Arm and sink up to your knees as the tide's going out and it dries around you like concrete and then you just don't get out. And as the tide comes in, unless somebody's come in with a, like the um, airport police have a, have a hovercraft and a big gigantic, looks like a paintball gun, but it shoots air <laughs> down by your leg or whatever appendage is stuck and kind of blows the mud out and they're able to pull you out. 
Good so, Lord. So that kind of thing. And, and, you know, we, we'd always tell the stories about, you know, some bride riding four wheelers out there got caught and the fireman had to give her mouth to mouth all the, as the tide come in, it came in and then he died. And, and that happened, but it happened in the eighties, like about the time I was married, but we still tell that story to every newcomer that comes to Alaska as if it happened yesterday to terrify them. And, um, <laughs> You hear stories of people that saw a guy trapped in the trapped in the uh, mud flats, and a helicopter tried to pull him out, and it ripped him in half. And oh. I don't know if that ever happened, but boy, the kids tell the stories around here, so <laughs> they grow. Keeps them out of the mud flats. I was sure. gonna say maybe it's maybe it's a good thing they're telling that yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I kind of want to piggyback on Sean there to keep that thread of the, picking up on the in reading bone rattle actually the whole artist cutter series um i kind of have this uneducated opinion that the vastness of alaska's territory seems to embolden criminals who think they can just disappear to whim from the law um and with your experience uh in law enforcement there in alaska am i anywhere close to actually some truth about the mindset that those guys have well yeah ex- two things on that not that so many if if somebody ran from the lower 48 and thought they could hide up here if they tried to get out too far they would just stand out everybody would know that's a that's somebody that doesn't know what they're doing and Mm. basically the the land would take care of stopping them for us you know (laughs) but on the other hand because of all the things we just talked about the criminal the folks that commit crimes up here can be in my experience anyway, a bit harder, a bit tougher, a bit, um, you know, not to demean any poor criminals from the lower 48, but (laughs) we had a guy that ran from us. uh, Yeah. A couple of years before I retired or maybe about a year before I retired and he fled. Actually, I think he, I'm not sure. I think he fled the troopers and like ran into the woods and we sent some trackers out and then our entire uh, Alaska Fugitive Task Force went out. I was the chief. So I sat at home and listened on my radio, but uh, the task force went out and it was middle of the winter. It was in the like single below zero in the, in the minus single digits. And he ran across this place that was a big, kind of like a little shallow estuary and there's the the highway kind of swoops around the south side of turnigan arm uh, which is a big arm of the cook inlet ocean they call it turnigan because when captain cook tried to navigate he, the tide is so big he kept having to turn around and go back out again and then try it again and it's like a 30 foot tidal difference and Jeez. just huge and that's where the mud flats are too but it, but it ends it's not a through passage so this guy had bailed out of his car he had run and on the other side of the highway there's this little marshy area where the water's probably only two feet deep but it freezes but it doesn't freeze all the way solid sometimes even when it's super cold and then a mountain just rises up on the other side of it probably i don't know it's not a very big mountain probably 1500 feet something like that and just covered with scrub and trees and so he, they had his tracks going across there and a couple of our deputies were crossing and one of them fell through oh. and it, it just, he just fell up to his knees, but he was out, he was out of the chase because mm-hmm. once you get your foot wet and it's minus four or eight or whatever, you can't even, no matter how tough you are, yeah, you continue. So we don't know how many times that guy fell through, but he ended up up in the mountains. They set up a huge perimeter we had people go in and work shifts and they just had this perimeter around the mountain. Somehow he slipped through after spending a night on the mountain. Oh, and I forgot to mention he was in jeans and a t-shirt. What? Um, and uh, two days later, we caught him down in uh, Seward about 150 miles away. Unbelievable. So he spent the night up there on the mountain, kind of hung- hunkered up in his t-shirt just mean as a snake and i think that's what kept him alive and so so that makes a that makes for a 
a good adversary, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. You're not going to find that. Everybody else dies. So <laughs> only the mean ones I know I die. would. <laughs> well, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, as I said, you spent part of your uh, law enforcement career elsewhere um, besides Alaska. Alaska. Is Arliss um, destined for Alaska for the, uh, for the duration, or do you have an itch to move him somewhere else at some point? Oh, no. He, he'll always be up here as far as during the where he lives, mm -hmm. but I might take him to, uh, I think it would be fun to actually take him to the Cook Islands for a third of a book and just have him see Lola's, Lola's home country for a minute and then come back. And the, the, there's just so much untapped for Alaska that I can't, I can't see a, an end in stories that I want to tell right now for, um, you know, in, in Alaska, there's, there's sand dunes, there's the highest mountain in North America, there's, mm -hmm. there's the crab fisheries, I haven't even set anything out on Dutch Harbor yet, except the very beginning of Cold Snap, after the little scene I told you about, a portion of that happens in Dutch Harbor out on the illusions, but the entire story kind of, kind of the, the James Bond teaser, if you will, happens in Dutch Harbor, but mm -hmm. um, uh, there's so many stories. There's a, there's a little town down in um, Southwest Alaska called Hyder. And um, it's got kind of a, a claim to fame is it's across one side of the street is Stuart, British Columbia. And the other side of the road is Hyder, Alaska. And so during the mad cow disease crisis, you, you, like you couldn't, couldn't uh, walk over, a Canadian couldn't walk over to Hyder and eat a hamburger or vice versa, you know? <laughs> um, so there's just these quirky little places that are great places for, this sounds creepy, but they're great places for murder yeah. and great places yeah. for uh, a mystery. And, um, you know, Dawson... Yeah, there's just some awesome places. Well, first of all, that's the answer I was hoping to hear. Um, but, <laughs> but second of all, that brings up another question. So when you're planning out a novel, do you do you start with a location often? Like, do you say, you know what? This is a really interesting location. I want to feature this. What, you know, what kind of story could, could happen here? Or do you start with a story and then piecemeal it into the location? Yeah, a little bit of both, but I, I'm, I'm, as I'm traveling, I'm always looking for um, locations. A friend of mine and I are, uh, we were planning it for this last year, but it got derailed, but because of the, of COVID and going out in the villages, but um, we're planning a remote uh, uh, kayak trip from interior Alaska up on the Kobuk River, kind of the headwaters of the Kobuk, all the way down to Kotzebue and which is on the coast so like a three week or a month long kayak trip and there's little villages along the way that i've visited before just not by kayak this particular friend of mine brian corchell he's a bush uh, teacher and he he took his kayak from fairbanks down the yukon to mountain village um where he teaches it was like a five week trip so Jeez. it's not high in the sky when I say we're planning it. It's, it's stuff I've not done, but he's done. I've done rafting trips, but nothing quite that long. So, you know, that sort of thing. I like the, I like the, I like to jump back and forth with Arliss to have a, a bit of a urban adventure that always, you know, in Alaska, urban rural is, is five steps, you know? <laughs> um, and so I like in, in bone rattle, for instance, um, it's, urban it's around Juneau, but it's a short boat ride to the yeah. bowels of the mountain where he's underground in the the mine tunnels and that sort of thing yeah in cold snap it's almost all well i shouldn't say that it's half uh very rural like way remote and then lola happens to take care of some of the unresolved issues from bone rattle some of the plot lines that i and, I, and I don't know how much of the books you've read, the bone rattle you've read, but there's any book that I write, there's going to be some unresolved issues. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I own that and take the, not in the main plot, right. but I own that there's some unresolved issues that are going to be resolved later because that's the way life is. Yeah. And 
with, especially in law enforcement, I might be, you know, I might have been trying to solve a major, you know, case, whether it was a drug case or a, a, in, as a city officer, a homicide. But while I was doing that, there were still people getting robbed and still people getting yeah. sexually assaulted and all of that. And it, it kind of makes it more realistic to me as a, a reader when I see, oh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. This deputy marshal, detective, whatever, can't just focus on one thing like they do on TV. It's there's a sure enough in real life, there's an A story, a B story, and a C story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes true. the C story doesn't get sometimes the C story becomes the A story in the next book. Whenever you realize how bad that little underling really is or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought I was done with bone rattle and I, I read that very last piece and I'm like, wait, wait, what? Is there more pages? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I gotta wait. I apologize. Like I say, I own that. No, I, I like that. No, it, it did. I was like, there's another book coming. <laughs> yeah. That means I'm, I get to read a new story. Uh, and you mentioned this just a few minutes ago, um, the, the differences between Rarotonga and the Cook Islands and Alaska. And you wrote a lot of bone rattle in the Cook right. Islands. And so when you're, when you're sitting there in this beautiful tropical paradise, based on all the pictures that you post that we've seen, do you ha is there an extra time that it takes for you to mentally get back into the Alaska mindset when you're writing the settings or is it just so ingrained that it just pops out with, you know, with no real extra effort? No, I mean, I, I guess it all takes effort, especially with my pea brain, but I, <laughs> but I think that um, not so much the writing about, you know, Alaska and Rarotonga or Rarotonga and Alaska. I, I, uh, you know, or writing a Clancy while I'm in Rarotonga. It's definitely easier to have been somewhere, but I don't need a reminder of how cold snow is because I've been in, you know, or how, how rough it feels or how, or how, like the other day I was writing, I don't remember what the scene was, but I was writing about how, how tight your jaw or my jaw, I don't know if other people have this experience, but I was writing about how you get this particular tightness in your jaw when somebody's shooting at you. Mm. And I don't need anybody to shoot at me to remind me of that. I can, <laughs> I can look back on that and conjure the feeling again. And I think it's that way with Alaska is that got that same kind of intensity mm. that uh, especially the stuff that I hope I'm writing about the intense stuff that I can. Now I probably a, a harsher truth is that there are little things that I forget. And sometimes after I've written the book, I'll come back here and go, Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot about the way this works or the way that works. I'll insert that in and, you know, praises be for copy edit time. So I can <laughs> add them back in. So he, he gets tightness in his jaw and everybody else gets looseness in their bowels. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might have another physical reaction if I'm being shot at, I'm sure. <laughs> well, here you've done it again. You've survived the main portion of our interview. Fantastic. Sweet. Congratulations <laughs> on that. And here we go into, as For you being know, kind. the lightning round, where we ask silly right. questions and expect a little bit of silliness Brace from myself. seriousness. Okay, so, all right, I'm going to go first. Number one. Does bear spray actually work on Alaskan browns or do they just use it as breath freshener? <laughs> I have a, I have a friend in the marshal service who would take our pepper spray and spray it into the top of his vodka and drink it. Cause oh. he said it made it sound, it tastes more expensive. Um, <laughs> it doesn't, it, it doesn't work on everybody or everything, but it's certainly better to have than teeth and fingernails. Cause we're, uh -huh. we're basically, hairless toothless bears when we go out <laughs> into the woods and um so yeah it's good to have something yeah the weakest of the, of the bunch mm -hmm. all right number two with the recipes offered at the end of bone rattle i would like to know the working title to the inevitable mark cameron cooking show <laughs> I don't know. Grump, grumpy rules i don't i don't know grumpy, okay grumpy. that's not bad so where did you get this idea of putting the recipes in there? You know, 
um, I got so much feedback from the cooking segments in open carry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people wrote me and wanted to know if I had the recipe for the scrambled eggs or I had the recipe for the, uh, uh, French onion soup. And honestly, I put those in there because I want to show not to teach somebody to cook the, in the first book, but I want to, if it's just action, 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 you really don't see what kind of character you're dealing with. And so it, it was, uh, a way to give exposition without giving a bunch of exposition and really show his, <laughs> you know, I mean, he can say, you know, somebody, another character character in open carry, for instance, could say um, January, the girl on the, the native girl on the boat could marvel at what a great homemaker he was, or he could make her soup and it would mm -hmm. be an interactive way uh, like dialogue and cooking is, okay. um, you know, I, I taught a, a, I taught, I think um, Nick Petrie and I did a, a little a thing about fights and fight scenes. And I've always believed that, that fighting, that human conflict is a kind of dialogue. And I use it like dialogue in the book. It's a communication. Mm -hmm. And I think cooking is that way too. So I got so much feedback from open carry on those two things that I kind of thought, well, I'll just, I'll just include a recipe or two in the back and we get good, re really good uh, feedback about it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I, I, and it's, it's the kind so of stuff easy. I make with my grandkids anyway. So my oldest two grandsons are really those nephews. They're just, if you ever see them on Facebook, you know, that's who I'm. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. After. I, cause I read that and I'm, and all I do is picture your grandkids and I'm like, Oh, so that's what they're like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they are exactly like that. Just that's a, what I thought. Just a little bundle of emotions, but super yeah. smart and cool. Cool. All right. Last one. Looking at boats is Arliss Cutter's kryptonite. What is Mark Cameron's weakness? Looking at boats. <laughs> <laughs> so we know. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. I dream. That's I love looking at boats. Too. I know. Absolutely. I know. My wife is a freak about it. She loves it. <laughs> okay. So my first question is: um, during the research of your books, you you do a lot of a lot of hands on, actually feet on the wilderness. So <laughs> it, I, it would be a better descriptor um, research. And you're an adventurous soul. Clearly, you're an adventurous soul. You you were going to be planning a kayak trip for a month across Alaska. What is the one adventure out there in the world? that's like in your head that you hope to do that you haven't done yet? Um, there's a really good friend of mine, a, a place where we stay in Rarotonga named, um, the place we stay is called Arcadia Retreat. It's the Peter uh, Hayes and his wife, Jolene own it. And there it's really just three houses. And we rent one of the three houses and a pool. Mm. And uh, we rent that. But, but Peter is, uh, they're both, Peter and Jolene are both expert sailors. I think she grew up on a sailboat and he sails every weekend in his homemade uh, Vaca, the double hulled canoe sailboat, like in Moana, that the big yeah. canoes yeah. in Moana. He's got a small version of that that's built the traditional way, tied together and all of that. Wow. Um, and he's a he's an incredible sailor but he's good on the water. He knows everybody. He's been in, he's from New Zealand, but he's been in on Rarotonga for 30 years, hmm. become a wonderful friend. And he's come up with this idea that we're going to rent a, a charter, a uh, tramp steamer and get like five to seven couples, which will be all this tramp steamer can hold because they move cargo to the outer islands. And we're going to take a month or a month and a half and just hit the Pacific and go out and go from island to island and kind of be our own little, you know, Jack London slash Somerset mom slash yeah. whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and just explore, explore the Pacific and be on a boat and see some of these places that there are no, um, there are no airports to these islands. You can't right. get there they're too small mm. um so that's the that's That'd the next fantastic i'll be... probably actually be doing that before the kayak trip that was gonna happen um well i shouldn't say that we were we had hoped to make it happen 
this coming spring, but they're just not letting anybody in the water there. Oh, uh, right. That's, that sounds spectacular. Yeah. Second question is a little easier. Um, what percentage of you is grumpy and what percentage of you is Arliss? Hmm. Well, Arliss is way cooler than me. And I, I think he's made up of a ton of folks that I've known over the years. And uh, grumpy is also way cooler than me. But if I was going to identify with any character in the book, it would be grumpy. I, uh, you know, Arliss gets to say all those cool things that we all wish we'd said in a, in a debate or whatever. Yeah. He's just on point all the time because he yeah. has the benefit of you know, being edited and rewritten, <laughs> but, um, but uh, Grumpy is, Grumpy is kind of my hero. I, I aspire to be like Grumpy. So it, it, it's hard for those of us that know you in a little bit to picture you as anybody named Grumpy because um, <laughs> just because it, that's the last thing that you come across as, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> All right. My last question, um, instead of writing a new one, I decided to delve into the, the greatest hits of, of <laughs> lightning round questions from, uh, from the crew reviews. And I actually, I actually didn't write this one, um, but we'll, we'll pose it and see if the answer is any different. Would you rather be stabbed at the arm or the leg? <laughs> I'm just going to say, if you ask one of those, that's... <laughs> you don't have to answer. <laughs> I, 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 I can't confirm or deny, but there, there might be a character named Bishop that dies horribly in the next book. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Poor guy. That's still one of my favorite moments in the show. Just oh, that's a yeah. little shot of that's your... hilarious. <laughs> Hey, I'm just seriously, and Mike, I know I was gonna yeah sign out, but this is again, I, I just I can't wait for the next Arliss book. I, lo I love this character. I, I feel Thank like you. um the Alaska should be paying you for uh, you know being a travel ambassador. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Even I mean, Stone Cross is like the last place I would think I'd ever want to go, <laughs> but after reading that book, I felt like I gotta experience that, even if it's just for a day. I gotta go somewhere like that. Um, you should. So you do a hell of a job uh, selling your state. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the last frontier for a lot of folks, you know, and and so I think it it still holds that it still holds the 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 mystique of the Wild West back from the old days because I think a lot of Alaska still harbors a lot of that thought, whereas mm -hmm. now Colorado or Nevada or something is you know that's that's kind of out of the <laughs> yeah. out of the talk. But yeah, Bone Rattle was fantastic, and. I, I feel like I get to visit a little bit of Alaska every time I, I read it. And, um, and for me, you know, a little bit of an adventurous spirit that really satisfies me in a lot of ways uh, above and beyond just the characters and the lives that are living. So yeah, love this book uh, a ton. I can't wait for the next one, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. We got to, I tell you every time, but we got to do a remote show up here. Sometime. We do, don't we? We honestly, we you would not have to talk us into it. I mean, like, no, I, we I keep talking about it for had, sure. Had COVID not happened, we, we might have already done that. Yeah, I think that. so. Well, you just, you think you got to, you're doing these remote anyway. People are talking to you online. Just come up here, do them remote from here. We have, yeah. We have internet. We have and we have cans with string. We can. Talk I honestly don't another. care if you have internet. I just want to come up and sit around. <laughs> I just want to do it by the fire. I don't care. <laughs> we'll tell everybody about good, the interview. <laughs> good, good, good. That sounds great. We didn't, we couldn't show you, but here's what happened. <laughs> and I'd be remiss to to mention that obviously Chris isn't with us today. He had a, a family situation that he had to take care of, but. Uh, in his spirit, we want to, uh, all three of us, thank you for coming on again and talking about Bone Rattle. And we cannot wait for the next one. Folks, you got to get out and buy thank this you. fantastic book. So thank you, cheers so to you, pal. Thanks for coming on again. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks, Uncle Mark. See ya. <laughs> hey, we want to thank Mark Cameron for coming on the episode today. His novel, Bone Rattle is out, please go out and buy this. It's fantastic, it's the third in the Arts Cutter series. And as he said, he's got another one cooking, folks. It's coming out. And join us every Monday when we have another best-selling author. And here is my dynamic partner, Sean Cameron, filling in for Chris Albanese and portraying himself. I'm out of whiskey, sadly. Mm. But I'm not out of bone rattle. Wait, listen, if you shake the book. Magic. 
All right, my turn, eh? Yes, sir. All right, I'm expecting some body parts with Chris missing. Let's go. Let's you have to pick up your game a little bit here. All right, this is the outro for Mark Cameron and Bone Rattle in three, two, go. Hey, we want to thank Mark Cameron on the show today. Well, thank him on the show today. Well, the show's over. I can't <laughs> thank him on the show. show. <laughs> it's a retro step. All right, number two. And good. <laughs>